You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here, and I'm joined for one last time on Cargo of Eagles by Marjorie Allingham, by my good friend Lachlan. Lachlan, I think uh, I think you've done an excellent job getting through this novel. I hope you've enjoyed getting to the end of Cargo of Eagles. How does it feel reaching the end of your first Death of the Reader text? I'm more than anything, it's just a relief to know what happened, but. Um, <laughs> It was a really fun experience. I didn't expect to be so invested in the story as I ended up being. Yeah, I think it's one thing that Marjorie Allingham and Philip Young and Carter have done like really well is that this novel, a lot of the way through to me, it felt really all over the place, kind of messy in some ways. But you get to the end and it does that beautiful wrap up where suddenly you go, oh, and this tied in with that and this tied in with that. And like... You know, there's not been a particularly strong sense of theme, I think, over the entirety of this book. But when you get to the end and discover the the true identity, suddenly there's this realization that maybe it did actually all tie together. Yeah, it was like we were doing a puzzle blindfolded. Like I knew all the things were there. I just couldn't see what was going on. And as I was reading, we were jumping between all the different settings all the different characters. And I was trying mm. to figure out how they could be possibly related. And then we get to the end and I'm like, oh. That makes a lot of sense. (laughs) Yeah. We have this wonderful sequence where kind of Elsie Corcoran uh, gets reintroduced amidst the cast and we go through and finally have to figure out if it couldn't have been Burroughs, who has disappeared, and if it couldn't have been Teague, then who could it possibly have been haunting the demon of Salty, this small town out in Essex? You know, we've had, is it two deaths now? We've had Mossy and uh, Hector Askew who we've been trying to get to the bottom of, and it all ends up burdened with this idea that we've been discussing sneakily over the past couple of episodes, Lachlan, about family. And it, of course, turns out that there was one family we'd forgotten all along. Mm. I mean, I do need to admit that even though I was thinking about those families, it still was a slight shock when the reveal happened. I was like, oh my God, I didn't even see that coming. It was a very nice way to end the book and have everything fit together very neatly. I was I was happy with it. I did really like, it's been something that I've been struggling with over the course of this book. You know, we've had Albert Campion, as I've said over the past episodes, as this like spy master character who's coming in and solving things from the outside. We don't actually get to see a lot of his detective work, but he'll often show up and be like, yes, so I went for this 20 minute walk and stood here for 20 minutes to see if it was possible for this alibi to be true. Like, it's a bit weird having that all be off screen by our supposed protagonist in this story. But at the same time, it does work really nicely as this like send off for Marjorie Allingham's campion, because by the end of this book, it's Philip Youngling Carter's campion. Yeah, I think that was a big reason why I was so suspicious of him last week when I thought maybe he had something to do with it, but he was just off solving things on his own, not even bothering to share it with us. I'd be tempted even to go back and read the first few just to see, because like this version of him is the only one I know. I want to know. You seem to think of him as like this really impressive detective who just knows everything, but I don't know if I got that because all of the mystery solving sort of happened off screen, kind of not off screen, but you know, in that sort of sense. Yeah, I've only I've only read a couple of Campion novels because The Trader's Purse, which is the eleventh book in his original series, was the first one that I'd read, and I I did it right before this on the show, and I've been kind of following along and putting the pieces together alongside trying to squeeze in a couple of extra books where I can and finally here in you know Cargo of Eagles he's really landed away from from kind of the the hero we knew him as and he's now sending in weirdly an American to do his work for him yeah I mean Morty seems to have done a good job I was skeptical of him when he came on as as an American in in this British town It, it still feels a little bit unnatural to me. And I I hate Mm. to offend knowing (laughs) who I'm speaking to, but... He, he did well. He, he represented his country very well. I mean, do you think so? I didn't really get the vibe. Like, aside from people saying that he was American and he spoke American, he didn't, like, feel distinct amidst the cast. It was more that he was young. That was kind of what he, he felt. It wasn't that he necessarily felt, like, out of place. Yeah, and I mean, maybe that is the American, like, optimism coming through that they maybe. were trying to write. But I do agree. He felt more young than American, which 
maybe that's a good thing. I did find it kind of interesting. Uh, I was having a read through and it turns out that, uh, you know, I mentioned in the first week, the like throwback to the Aeneid and Dido as a character of ancient Roman mythology. Uh, it turns out that Marjorie Allingham and Philip Youngman Carter's first creative project together was a play about Dido and Aeneas. So there's probably like a nod in there. So even though it's really difficult to me, I think, to see the like seam between where their two parts of the work kind of began and ended, there definitely is a certain amount of like a nostalgia and reminiscence on Allingham and Carter's relationship and marriage in this book even though it never mentions it explicitly and i like i'm so curious uh as to like i haven't had the chance to read carter's autobiography uh, which was released in 1982 but i'd be really curious to see like what nods in here were made that are just for them and not not kind of for the audience because I, I get the vibe that there are a few. Yeah, I mean, if I was struggling to pick up on the references that were meant to be obvious, there must be infinite there that I completely miss with yeah. the hidden ones. Did you feel like Throstle got enough of a send-off? I don't know how many characters I would say were treated perfectly um, well at the end, but yeah, him especially, I was I was a bit like, oh... You know, he 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 did a lot of work, and then to end the book with it, it it felt a bit um underwhelming. Yeah, like we we spend so much time jumping between other perspectives and seeing the police approach the crime and starting to get involved with Salty, and then the journalists show up, and then they leave, and the town goes back to normal. There's this big ebb and flow, like the tide rolling in and out to what's going on in Salty. But at some point, uh, towards the end. You know, Campion. What he, he he basically like unveils the crime, and he's like, "Well, we could be accessories to murder if we mess around with this too much. So let's just leave it to the police, and then we never see the police again." I don't know that that confused me a little bit because are they not meant to be working with the police at at some level? Throssell felt. I don't know. Can I can I pick your brain on something here, Lachlan? Throssell as a character, I feel like his name is an adjective. It is not it is not a noun for a detective. I feel like throstle is the word I would use to describe his mood. It's like not quite bumbling, a little bit overwhelmed uh police character who's just just a little bit flustered. I would I would describe him as throstled. Mm, I I don't disagree. <laughs> it's like weirdly weirdly a perfect name for the character because i've i've come to think of it as like yeah that's just he, he's he's throstle how else would i describe him <laughs> you couldn't write it better i thought the other one that was kind of interesting talking about like character resolutions was that dido and morty i kind of expected to have a bit more of a relationship by the end of the story did you yeah i really thought that was like a an arc that was coming and then did they end end up together at all I mean, they ended up, like, physically adjacent and, uh, you know, Morty is there for Campion's big heroic moment where he comes out of the trees with a bunch of people holding torches to accost the culprit, basically. And so Morty, like, in this moment where he heroically charges in and goes to um <laughs> and goes to rescue his love interest, Dido, he gets just completely... <laughs> has the rug completely pulled out from underneath him by Campion coming in and being like, ah, oh, no, young young boy, I am the protagonist of this novel. <laughs> it felt like that um, saving Dido's life was kind of a bit mm. put in there more just to give her a reason to be interested again in him after being completely turned yeah. off more than a, a, a plot mm. point. Because there was a point about like two thirds of the way through the book where like, you know, uh, Dido almost like dumped Morty and it was like okay well this is the, this is the won't they before the will they but no they just kind of never never really comes back around <laughs> they they never will apparently well maybe they will i hope maybe. they do anyway we should jump off of this and get on into the mystery section where we finally get to debate your performance in this here murder mystery i can't wait for that <laughs> I yeah. think I did really well. This is Death of the Reader. We are discussing Cargo of Eagles by Marjorie Allingham. Here on your Murder Mystery World Tour, stick around for that. Debriefs to come. This is 2SER 107.3.
you're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here with you here on your Murder Mystery World Tour. And we are joined finally, at long last, after years of requests by one Solari Gentle, by Chris Hammer, author of Scrublands, Treasure and Dirt, and most recently, The Tilt, as well as several other books between the Chris Hammer Extended Universe. It's getting pretty broad these days. Chris, it is wonderful to have you on the show to talk about The Tilt. Welcome to Death of the Reader. Uh, Thank you so much. So good to be here. So often in the world of crime fiction, we operate in tidy parallels, neat coincidences, so that when it all wraps up in the end, there's a symmetry to it all. I felt like from a mystery perspective, which is my home turf, That was the core question of the tilt. Would these crimes, would these slowly unveiling bodies after bodies all have these neat parallels? Talk to me about the messiness of reality, Chris. Well, my challenge with this book is there's three different timelines in the book. One is a young lad, aged about 11, in this big forest in World War II. And the forest in in, um, question is the Barma Millawa Forest, the world's biggest red gum forest, a real place down on the Murray River. So you've got this kid in the forest mining the cattle. Then you've got a story of a teenage girl growing up in the 70s in a nearby town. And then you have the contemporary story, which is Nell Buchanan, the homicide detective, newly minted. And she's trying to um, solve a cold case. A a body has been found in this forest, right? So my challenge was how to tie them all together because they do eventually, but it's hard to keep the pace going, three different points of view, three different timelines, and then they do gradually kind of meld together. So, yeah, that that was quite a challenge and it was it started out messy. That's the beauty of crime fiction, though. You can always you can always tidy up and you can always find out who did it and you can always resolve all the issues, at least if you want to. Yeah, I thought one thing that was really apparent to me, both in reading but especially in rereading this book, was the strength of voice in between these three eras. You really captured, if not... Uh, Like, I can't speak to the accuracy as a young man from the 21st century, but at least very distinctly captured a tone of voice for each of those three different eras. I guess, what was the process for you in kind of uncovering the personalities and the eras in which those personalities were written from? The story of the young lad with the cattle was the seed for that was planted years ago when I did a nonfiction book during the height of the millennial drought about the fate of the Murray-Darling Basin, and I spent about a week in that forest. And I met this old man in his 80s, a guy called Tim Mannion, and he told me about when he was aged 11 how he had to go into the forest and mine the family cattle uh, at the height of a drought. And that just planted the seed for that storyline, which in the book is told by an old man, you know, in the present day, remembering what it was like when he was a lad. So that's one voice, probably owes something to that gentleman that I I met, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. The teenage girl in the the 70s, I'm old enough to um, remember the 70s. I had an older brother and and sister who bought a lot of music, and music was really important back then, particularly if you lived outside the major cities kind of glued the youth to, to, together at a, a time of some rebellion. So I think a little bit of the voice there. So her, her story, though, is told past tense, but as if it's happening. And then Nell's story is the contemporary story, and it's told present tense. So the, the voice of the, of the three uh, narrators, if you like, are all quite distinct. That And that was fun to do. That was fun sort of exploring that as a writer. Yeah, I I suppose the thing that you point out there that was really interesting to me was the use of music as this kind of binding element for the era of the 70s. And to some extent, each era of the book does share that binding element, you know, in the modern day, because the story is told through the lens of a newly minted homicide detective, a lot of the overlaps in careers with the local cop Kevin and how, you know, Nell used to work where he's looking to move to uh, you know, the youth in the 1970s, even though they all listen to different music, all bond over the fact that there is music. And I don't want to talk about what binds the 1940s together because I feel like that answer is given way too late in the game, but I did love that glue together. I guess, you know, 
people coming together over history has changed so much, but how do you recognize those pieces of glue when you're trying to bind characters together for each era? Each era has its own characteristics, of course, but deep down people are essentially the same. And, you know, you read historical novels set back in the, you know, the Middle Ages or the Roman Empire and the motivations end up being very similar and the people end up being similar. And that's how I look at my characters. I'm not, I'm, I don't try and have someone as a every woman or an every man from a particular era. I have them as an individual with all their you know, idiosyncratic sort of flaws and virtues and how then how they operate in that world. I thought it was interesting the way that you turn that concept on its head, that the binding agent in the modern day has two sides to it where one is terrible. And down in this big forest, it's become a something of a magnet for uh, anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists and, and preppers. And so that adds a certain sort of colour to the book, adds a bit of humour at times, it adds some real threat at, at times. I'm not... But I don't paint those characters as necessarily bad or evil, um, more like they're being manipulated by people, you know, with, with, with bad motives and evil motives and whatever. And I think this is something that crime writers pick up on a, a little bit is what's, what are the issues in so- so society today that are kind of troubling people? It helps add atmosphere and, and you know, if people find it troubling, you know, it's there in a book, so it makes the book topical because the beauty of a book too is you can resolve all those issues as well. Well, yeah, I mean, one of the great things about the way that you've kind of done character exploration in this book too is that by kind of using Ivan almost as us in the story where we are the offsider occasionally reaching into like, you know, almost throwing our feedback in in the same way that you would hear feedback from readers in between each iteration of your series – and I thought it was such a great way to explore Nell, like, on her own so much more than Treasure and Dirt, where, you know, it, it's much more personal to her because it's a town near where her family lives. It's, you know, potentially a relative of hers is one of the list of missing people that they're working through to identify these bodies. Why was it Nell you chose to give the focus in this book? Well, my, my first three books featured Martin Skarsden and increasingly his partner, Mandalay Blonde. And all those three books, they they got quite, as well as the puzzles of crimes and whatever, there's an emotional element to them. And I didn't know how how I could take that much further. So I thought, I'll just take a break and I'll write a standalone novel. But as I was writing it, both Ivan and particularly Nell grew on me. And so that's why Nell is a point of view character here, because not only does she have the frustrations of being a newly minted homicide detective, really sort of fighting the odds to get a result, it becomes personal, intensely personal, because the question then starts arised, you know, are some of her family members actually implicated in the killing? On one hand, she's very tough and resilient, and she stands up for herself, and, you know, she's not easily intimidated, you know, on another level, she's quite vulnerable and sensitive. So that kind of inner conflict within the character makes it makes it interesting. And I think I think many readers will you know like her. They'll think, oh, this is, you know, she she certainly doesn't. <laughs> She's not always a winner, put yeah. it that way. Because she's newly minted, she's left kind of to her own devices with only Kevin, uh, the local cop, to to kind of help her out. You really get to see that kind of laid bare while Ivan, as I said, kind of takes this almost readership role where he's he's calling in. I guess the thing that was interesting about advice coming in on high there as we also start to deal with like the Australian war memorial and war archives because of the old prisoner of war camp that used to be there. There were prisoners of war, Italian prisoners of war in the Barmer Forest during World War II. These were captives from early on in the war when the Australians were fighting in North Africa and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Italians surrendered and many of them were shipped to Australia and in turn, but they're often like put to work, particularly those river towns like down along the Murray and the Murrumbidgee. Many of them were really settled and developed post-Second World War uh, and, you know, with irrigation schemes. 
So they are incredibly multicultural. You go to a town like Mildura and they have like uh, 60 different nationalities. Well, Chris, I'm going to cut us off here. There is, of course, a much bigger extended version of this discussion on the podcast if people want to catch it. But thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Well, thank you so much for, for reading it and thanks so much for having me on. And it'd be a pleasure to come back anytime. No worries. I look forward to it. This is Death of the Reader. We are discussing Marjorie Allingham's Cargo of Eagles, and we'll be back with more of that in just a second. Thank you to Alan and Unwin for hooking us up with a copy of this book. Stick around. More to come. You're on 2SER 107.3. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here with Lachlan for Marjorie Allingham's Cargo of Eagles. Lachlan, it is time to debrief you on the murder, the mystery, the conundrum, the chaos of this book. Spoilers all the way to the end, obviously, as we debrief here. I want to know out the gate, Lachlan, how, how well did you feel you did? I think I did appallingly. I, I don't think I got <laughs> anything right. That was maybe I, like... In terms of predictions I've made in my life, and there aren't many, but this mm. one has to be at the bottom, the, the worst I've ever done. Yeah, I took I took you uh, under my wing here because you've been producing some other material for me, like you've been doing uh, Tummy Treasures over on Tuesday Drive, uh, which has been an absolute delight over the past few weeks. It was kind of fun getting to see you like swept up by the constructs that Allingham and Philip Youngman Carter had kind of created here because... I don't know how you felt, but I think that the direction that you walked in was the direction that any character other than Campion would have walked. Yeah. I mean, it was a big jump to go from doing little food reviews to trying to solve an entire murder mystery book. And if you consider that, I didn't do terribly. Mm -hmm. And it, it did sort of feel like I was, as things were being revealed to the different characters in the book, I was sort of understanding it more. And that is probably very much the point of the book (laughs) it felt good to know that i was at least on the same page as everyone else in the universe that it was happening in i I was i was a little hopeful that you'd catch on the fact that the first scene set in a cafe was the most crucial clue (laughs) no 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 clearly not i wasn't thinking that far ahead or back because because we have that that first interaction with dido and morty and campion in the cafe and the owner of the cafe comes over to Dido and is like, oh, you know, what do you do for work? And it's her moment to be like, oh, I'm a doctor. Like, I have a career. How, You know, this is, this is the era of feminism. Step aside. But the clue that comes in there is, of course, that the latest girl has just run off, conveniently, right before the murder happens. I did enjoy that, you know, our, our opening and arguably most critical clue was in that very innocuous scene at the start. Thinking about it now, it was very clever and something that and maybe anyone else would have picked up on, but it, clearly I just wasn't thinking big enough. But I did, I, I liked knowing that if I was paying enough attention and really trying, I could have figured it out on my own. Mm. And clearly you did. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of my job around here. I, I thought it was really interesting because this mystery isn't like, is, is not fair in the conventional sense. You know, when we look at Van Dyne's rules and how there's not supposed to be any organized crime in the story and... You know, we, we've set our piece on Van Dyne here on the show, but I was impressed with the way that it still kind of plays on those ideas of having the crime be larger, but still makes it very small and human at the end. It doesn't feel like a murder mystery the whole way along until you kind of get to the end and go like, oh, okay, yeah, no, I see the clues now. Um, it, it, its structure is actually quite clever in the way that it it feels more like a spy novel when, to some extent, I'd kind of argue it isn't. I mean, knowing nothing about Van Dyne and all of his incredible rules, I do agree. It didn't feel as though the whole way through I was looking for clues and things were needing to be solved. It was kind of enjoyable just sort of existing in the town and seeing all the characters interact more than trying to figure out what was going on. Although, like, that was very much the forefront of my mind. I liked that there was, like, nods to the history of the town and it felt like um, it was really, like, building the whole world for me and and I, I got a good understanding of Salty and all the ways that it interacted. And, you know, it wasn't enough for me to mm. know what was going on. But, like... It felt like there was enough drama there to keep me hooked and, and curious about everything. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did like in terms of, you know, bringing, bringing this town into the world, how 
Campion as a character was also like a vessel for us tying this small, you know, isolated from the outside world British town back in with like going out and meeting Monique and Stanislaus Oates towards the end of the novel. It, it felt nice in terms of saying that like, yeah, this town can move on from its past in the same way that Campion uh, and, you know, the, the world of being a spy has moved past him. It was quite an uplifting story in that sense. Like, uh, kind of optimistic in the way that everything wrapped up with the letting um, the, I forgot her name, the, the bikey murderer. Well, I just, I'm just going to go with Doll because I know that was her nickname. That was, okay. I don't remember her full name. Yeah. Well, all right. Doll, letting her go and, and having everyone just standing in the kitchen with a dead body in the next room, just sort of going on with their lives, having mm. coffee or whatever they were drinking. I mean, it was it was a bit weird, though, finding Burroughs, like, buried in James Teague's kind of archive. He's been, like, a set-piece background character the entire novel, Burroughs. Um, and, you know, we don't find out that much about him other than kind of the history of piracy and salty, only to then find his pirate corpse hanging from a rope in a wardrobe. There's, like, something you know, almost cinematic, like the pirate theme in general is something I'm a fan of. So I, I, I liked having that in the book, but having somebody there the whole time and not knowing too much about the role he was playing in the whole mystery was a bit interesting mm. to, to come to terms with. It was, it was perhaps a too, uh, all too literal interpretation of the skeletons in the closet motif, you know? That's very good. That That's enough to end the show on that. <laughs> if if only we were at that point. <laughs> I, I guess in terms of other things that I really did want to give a shout out to from this book, one of my favorite passages, right towards the end of the book, there's this beautiful scene, which as a fan of detective fiction, I just absolutely love. It was Campion talking, he says, you're still being damn mysterious. Do you get a kick out of it? To which Campion responds, my dear, I am only vague because I should hate to be wrong. If you want to share in the proceedings, you'll be more than welcome, but it's fair to say that they may rather be protracted and unpleasant. Nine parts boredom to one part terror. A very usual formula. I I loved that summary of, like, detective fiction. I think that it's interesting in that it's not a particularly competent mystery novel, but if you treat it as one, it rewards you for doing so by making it feel more co cohesive. Uh, that was kind of a cool vibe to me. I don't think it's like necessarily the most easy to access book for new readers coming into murder mystery, but if you're a bit of a veteran, there is a, there is a bit of fun there. That's a good starter for me then. <laughs> I think I think so. Now, it's come to that part where I I must I must award you points. I want to out of out of 4, you know, I got to give you one for presenting two slightly different theories the first and second week. So you, you're walking away with one. I, I think I think I'm going to let you away with with two points total, one for two different theories and one for kind of, you know, catching on to the way that dynasty was a part of this town and the like signature methods of our two different killers. Uh, you're you're a long way off, I think, from getting a proper solution to the story, which I wouldn't feel bad about. As I said, it's a spy novel. It's not a great first mystery novel. But, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize that you, you did approach the right clues, even if you didn't, uh, didn't necessarily swing them in the right direction. I mean, if I'm getting points, I'll take them. I'm not going to argue about getting them. <laughs> or, I'm happy with two. I'm glad. I'm glad. Lachlan, I apologize to you for putting you through this trauma, but I also greatly appreciate you coming through and uh, filling in in this filling in in this time of need for Death of the Reader. I also apologize. I, I wish I could have done better. <laughs> uh, either way, Lachlan, thank you so much for joining us. You'll be here behind the scenes on the program, so I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about missing Lachlan if you're at home going, oh, but he's such a nice chap. We'll never hear from him again. He'll he'll be around. Don't you worry. Absolutely. This is Death of the Reader. I wanted to let you know that next week on the show, we are covering E.C. Bentley's Trent's Last Case, chapters one to five, said by some to be the first novel of the golden age. The text that when you look back as a historian and want to say, where did this golden age thing start? It is Trent's last case, they allege. Either way, we'll be back with that on the show next week. Herds back from Antarctica for your murder mystery world tour. I'm Flex. See you then. You're on to SER 107.3.